Every evening here at the Wagga border, soldiers from India and Pakistan put on a display of showmanship, nationalism, and hostility. Seventy years ago, the British drew a line on a map dividing their South Asian empire into two nations. It led to the biggest, most violent migration in human history. A million people died. I'm Steve Chow. On this special episode of 101 East, we examine how India and Pakistan were born in blood, sparking the bitter rivalry that continues to this day. Pakistan acclaims the transfer of British power as Mr. Jinnah, Governor General of the New Dominion, arrives at the Constituent Assembly in Karachi. August 1947. A century of British rule over its Indian Empire comes to an end. Guests of honor in the Muslim capital were Lord and Lady Mountbatten, carrying out one of their last vice-regal duties before the partition of India took effect. the new nation of Pakistan is born. Meanwhile, in Delhi, the stage was set for British rule to give place to the new dominion of India. A day later, across a newly drawn border, leaders celebrate the birth of the Republic of India. Freed from colonial rule, the creation of these two countries completes a long struggle for independence. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. But even before the celebrations are over, chaos erupts. Panic and fear sets in as neighbor turns on neighbor, unleashing mass violence. Millions flee their homes. The celebrations were always marred by blood. They took place against the backdrop of horrific violence. People who a year before would have attended each other's wedding parties are murdering each other, raping each other's daughters, roasting each other's babies on spits. When human passions are unleashed, none of us can, can foresee what could happen. While historians recount the horrors of the past, for those who lived through them, it's like yesterday. लेकिन जो दो आदमी सारे पिंडों से हमला किया था, पंजिया आदमियों जो 18 बंदे उन्होंने मारे थे। 86-year-old Joginder Singh Kohli was a young teenager in India at the time. 70 years on, he still remembers how Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs turned on each other. और सारे पिंडों ही बाकी हैं, वीरांवाली सी, और बिडो सी। she was very, very beautiful. Muslims were very in the house. They were very Muslim. 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 On the other side of the border in Pakistan, the memories are just as strong. In 1947, Saladin Khalid's family were Muslims in India. He's never forgotten how he escaped the killing, but others didn't. We were staying in our house on 6 September 1947, at 6 o'clock, when my mother was saying her prayer. I 
heard a shriek crying somebody hmm? i turned in i saw a sikh with a sword in his hand coming and my sister is running and uh, first they entered the uh, room of my uh, mother killed her then they ran toward us this is the house Saladin fled his home in fear of his life. When he returned, the horror lay in front of him. When I entered the house, it was just like a, you know, the uh, butcher house, nothing, slaughter house. When you see your own mother drenched in blood and stomach open, the intestine coming up, how would you feel? How did it all come to this? Many point the finger at India's then colonial masters. When Britain ruled India, it was the jewel in the empire's crown, plundered for its natural resources. But in the devastating aftermath of World War II, Britain had its own problems on the home front. The Blitz has returned to London with renewed fury. And official opinion is now quite in the, the country has bankrupted itself fighting itself to death with the Nazis. Uh, and uh, so British historians say that uh, it was the exhaustion of the empire and the bankruptcy of the mother country that led to the realization that there was simply no way that the British could keep this enormous uh, empire in chains, that the, uh, the moment had come to uh, head back home to a land of rationing, drizzle, low light, <laughs> uh, and leave the exotic plains of India behind. After decades of crushing any movement towards Indian independence, post-war Britain had neither the will nor the might to hold on to its colony. There was massive demonstrations across India, uh, and there was uh, uh, an awareness that, that the, the leaders of the freedom struggle could call strikes and protests, which would paralyze the country. Seizing the moment of British weakness, three leaders spearheaded the push for independence. Jawaharlal Nehru, Mohammed Ali Jinnah, and Mohandas K. Gandhi. At first, they shared the goal of a free and united India. One country, one people, regardless of religion. Thousands of nationalists crowd the great tent to hear the message of Gandhi, leader of the demands for India's independence. It was Mahatma Gandhi who mobilized the masses, who gave them the language of things like civil disobedience and nonviolence, who spoke of the nationalist struggle as a struggle for truth. He gave it a strong moralistic fervor, and he completely inspired the masses to rise up uh, behind him. For Gandhi himself, the lifelong preacher of nonviolence. And Gandhi um, uh, went on fairly quickly uh, to establish himself as the spiritual leader of the Indian National Congress led freedom struggle. The Indian National Congress was a political party made up of the elite of Hindu and Muslim society. It had been pushing for self-rule since the turn of the 20th century. With Gandhi's mobilization of the masses, the party transformed into a populist movement and attracted new leaders with new ambitions men like Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, Nehru was very attracted to Mahatma Gandhi, and Gandhi was very impressed with him. And he was Gandhi's hand-picked protege to lead the, the sort of political part of the national movement. Gandhi himself never took any political position, didn't want one. Uh, and Nehru did everything from leading the Indian National Congress as one of its youngest ever presidents to becoming eventually the first prime minister of independent India. And Mr. Nehru presided over the first cabinet meeting. Both Nehru and Gandhi were Hindus, but the third member of the influential trio was a Muslim, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was an extremely um, interesting man, educated, uh, very Anglophile, in fact, culturally far more Anglophile than, than either Nehru or Gandhi. Um, always dressed in Western clothes, had Western habits, enjoyed his scotch and uh, and, and his sausages and his ham sandwiches, he wasn't particularly strongly observant uh, Muslim. 
and, and a man who was hailed uh, as the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity. A lawyer, Jinnah began his political life within the Hindu-dominated Indian National Congress. Later on, he also joined the Muslim League, a group protecting the Muslim minority. Both parties were fighting for an independent India, which at the time was Jinnah's ultimate goal. Jinnah is strongly opposed to the idea of a separate Muslim nation. And indeed, he is saying, this is British divide and rule. You know, they want us to be divided. We've got to stand together. We've got to fight for our freedom. If we don't fight for our freedom together, we will never be free. But he increasingly gets sidelined by a new, younger generation of leadership, among whom particularly there is, uh, there is Nehru, who is his nemesis. Pandit Nehru, who calls for an Indian Republic, is accused by the League of working for domination over the Muslim minority. Britain, making every endeavor With Britain's India, grip on India weakening, Nehru and the Indian National Congress grew in power. Nehru wanted a new India to have a strong central government, run by his party. This alarmed Jinnah, who argued Muslim-majority regions should govern themselves. It was a losing battle. Jinnah realized that given the imbalance in political support between the League and the Congress, that the only way the League was ever going to actually come to any significant power was by advocating a separatist platform. Thousands of kilometers away in London, records reveal deeper insights into the fallout between Jinnah and Nehru. And this is one of the repositories of which there are a number in the building. At the, the National side. Archives, private letters Jinnah sent to British officials shows a relationship beyond repair. At this point, Jinnah is extremely suspicious of the Congress and um, he feels that it's it would be prepared to seize power by, um, by force, that it may have infiltrated the Indian National Army, um, and that he regrets that the Muslim League hadn't organized in the same way. So we're talking about serious mistrust at this point. Yeah, I, th I think this um, indicates complete breakdown in trust between, between the two parties and, the, and the, you know, it's the leadership of those parties. New Delhi, and although the scene looks quiet enough... Jinnah and Nehru had first come together to fight the British. Now they were fighting each other. Disturbances against the Muslim League soon reached the danger point. By 1946, any hope of a united India had evaporated. Order was restored, but beneath the surface, enmity between Muslim and Hindu... The breakdown at the top of Indian politics was mirrored on the streets, as tension spilled over into violence. Chaos erupted in major cities. First pictures of the grim ordeal faced by British and Indian troops during the worst riots in the history of Calcutta. Fires raged unchecked in many places, while pitched battles continued between Muslims and Hindus. For Muslims, the fear of being ruled by Hindus convinced them they needed their own separate nation. Even Jinnah, the man once hailed as the symbol of Hindu-Muslim unity, now demanded an independent Pakistan. After a century of British power in India, the empire's hand was finally forced. Charged with overseeing the withdrawal, was a decorated royal officer, one who would go down in infamy, Lord Louis Mountbatten. New Delhi airfield and the arrival of the Viceroy designate. Mountbatten uh, is a sort of vaguely comic character looking back, uh, a, a, a prancing peacock who loved his, uh, his robes and uh, costumes, uh, loved to appear as the Viceroy. Not a particularly brilliant man, uh, a man of some charisma, uh, a man of great sort of personal self-worth. <laughs> he was received by the. I think he, you know, whatever little homework he did, was fairly modest. Uh, and when he got to India, I think it was a crash course. He started meeting the various leaders, uh, had his own likes and dislikes inevitably, but very quickly decided that this thing had to be, this hot potato had to be dropped uh, as quickly as possible, unless it burned his hands and those of his. Uh, those of his masters, his, his, the English government. Lord and Lady Mountbatten have taken their places on the thrones for the swear... Mountbatten became Viceroy of India in March 1947. 
Britain had originally planned to leave India more than a year later, in June 1948. But Mountbatten wasn't going to wait that long. Mountbatten decided to accelerate it even faster, partly because he found his control and the control of the British soldiers uh, over India slipping. And so he accelerated it to August 15, 1947. And with that, a headlong rush into disaster happened, uh, with the British unable and unwilling to prevent some of the horrors that were unfolding before their very eyes. Horrors unleashed by hastily drawn lines on a map. The northwest state of Punjab was home to Hindus, Sikhs, but mostly Muslims. It was split, with one side forming the bulk of Pakistan. In the northeast of India, the state of Bengal was cut in two. The predominantly Muslim eastern half made up another part of Pakistan. Separated by nearly 2,000 kilometers of Indian territory, it would eventually become the independent country of Bangladesh. Was it well thought out? Was it ill thought out? Um, when the British had to uh, draw a line, they pulled in the civil servant who had uh, uh, never been to India before uh, and was sitting in his Cotswold garden when he was told that he had to fly next week to India uh, and divide the country in two. Uh, and uh, no one was pleased with the line he drew, uh, inevitably. The stage was set for British rule to give place... In to August 1947, as the flags of India and Pakistan were raised. Ordinary citizens were left in the dark as to what this meant for them. On the actual day uh, of partition in August, uh, the actual boundary hadn't been announced. So people didn't know whether they were in India or Pakistan, whether they could stay where they'd lived for centuries or whether they'd have to move. And it's only after that people tune into their radios to hear whether they will now be part of Pakistan or India. And everyone is shocked. Suddenly, people found themselves on the wrong side of a new border. Muslims in India, Hindus and Sikhs in Pakistan. There had been ethnic fighting between Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs before. The partition set off an unimaginable massacre. The whole of Lahore is on fire, it's like the Blitz. The, 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 the villages are all burning, hayricks are on fire. The platforms are literally awash with blood because a whole load of Hindus waiting on the platform to travel to India had been massacred. And another platform was covered with blood because the train had just arrived from India full of dead Muslims. Total chaos. In the rural areas, hideous scenes of pregnant women lying with their bellies ripped open, babies literally roasted on spits. Journalists in 1947 who had covered the opening of the Nazi concentration camps. Um, there were two or three journalists who'd covered that and then ended up covering partition, and they said that they saw more gruesome things in the Punjab countryside than they ever did in the concentration camps. Margaret Bourne White, the photographer, writes a graphic description, uh, and she says, you know, I saw Auschwitz, but what I saw in the Punjab was a million times worse. At the time, the British estimated 200,000 died in the violence. The consensus today among most historians is that the death toll was at least a million. Uh, the British had lost control long before partition, and that became clearly evident and visible in 1947, but in a way more terrible than anyone had ever expected. It was a complete and utter mess, total mess. Some suggest that Britain was aware of the impending horrors that would come with dividing up the Indian subcontinent. It was a mess made worse by Britain abandoning its colonies so quickly. In this document, which is, which is a telegram from the Foreign Office to its... Evidence in the National Archives suggests British leaders knew months before that ethnic violence was spiralling dangerously out of control. They say over, over 10,000 persons have been killed and many more injured over the last six months of the previous year. There'd been extensive communal violence. So they actually used the words civil war. Yes, yes, they mentioned here um, widespread recrudescence amounting almost to an organised and spontaneous civil war. The British were pretty much aware, well through the 40s, that the communities were arming. 
uh, but they didn't want to get involved in what they regarded as the subcontinent's periodic descent into communal frenzy. Gandhi famously goes on hunger strike, begging for peace, and Nehru is weeping and broken. But uh, uh, there are no images, I think, of Macbeth and head bowed in shame, tears on his cheeks. History is so often told through the eyes of leaders. But in Amritsar, India, just 30 kilometers from the border with Pakistan. This old building is being transformed into a new museum, keeping alive the memories of those who suffered the most. Partition is not about uh, the political events that led up to partition. It's about the impact uh, on each person who went through it and what it might have felt like for them to leave behind their homes, uh, to leave behind their friends, to leave behind the lives they'd known and to move to a new land, uh, you know, and to have to rebuild uh, afresh. It was less migration of people or partition of assets. It was this collective migration of sorrow. Wow, you've done a lot in just a few short months. Malika Aluwalia is the driving force behind Amritsar's Partition Museum. It's really shocking because if you think about the fact that within a few years of 9-11 happening, uh, a 9-11 museum was there, and there are now numerous Holocaust museums. There's a beautiful apartheid museum. So countries around the world have worked to memorialize these events that have shaped them. And I, I think it's, uh, it's very sad that, uh, that you know, this hasn't happened so far in the subcontinent. And survivors want to tell their stories. Amulak Swani remembers the day violence arrived on her doorstep. One it's stories like these the museum's curator is hoping to capture before it's too late. My granddad's 93 now, and we've seen over the last decade so many of his friends uh, leave us, you know, and so. There's a realization that within a few years, all these stories will unfortunately be lost. But they are tales not just of horror. They are also of collective kindness, where Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus protected each other. Malika believes a full recounting of what happened in partition could heal old wounds and dissolve the hatred between Pakistan and India that exists today. I think it's really important that we highlight the stories of humanity, that we highlight those stories of, uh, you know, friend helping friend, neighbor helping neighbor, but also stranger helping stranger. Um, and that, that those narratives shouldn't get lost because I think a lot of people who did make it to safety made it through the help of, um, of someone they knew. No. Hopefully one uh, outcome of this would be that we remember our shared humanity and uh, the shared history. For some survivors, forgiveness is the only way forward. <laughs> उस तो भी बुरा ना हो 
ਮੇਰੇ ਸੁਖ ਦਾ ਬੁਰਾ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਮੇਰੀ ਮਾਤਾ ਹੈਗੇ ਇਨ ਪਰਸਨ ਪਾਸਪੋਰਟ ਦਾ ਸੇਜਨ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਇੱਕ ਐਸਾ ਪਾਸਪੋਰਟ ਲਗ ਪਿਆ ਸੀ ਸੁਣਨਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜਾਣਨਾ ਬੁਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਭ ਬੁਰਾ ਕਰਿੰਦੇ ਮਾਫ ਕਰਨ ਕੋਈ ਸਿਆਣੇ ਬੁਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਫਿਰ ਨੇਕੀ ਕਰਨੀ ਹੈ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਲ ਕੀ ਹੋ but politicians on both sides haven't forgiven or forgotten 70 years on the hasty division of britain's empire continues to drive a bitter hostility between india and pakistan a hostility that has sparked wars a deadly insurgency and taken tens of thousands more lives In our next episode of 101 East, we examine how history continues to fuel mistrust and hatred between the nuclear powers of India and Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs>